Hello, welcome back to another lecture of Solitons. This is lecture 15. I remind you that last week we constructed the so-called Otto Becklund transform for the sine Gordon equation. This was given by a pair of relations between two functions uh, u uh, and v of uh, space and time. And it's constructed in such a way that uh, if v is a solution of the sine Gordon equation, then the u that we can find by solving uh, uh, these two relations uh, viewed uh, as a system of differential equations also solves uh, the sine Gordon equation. And in particular, we apply this uh, to uh, the case in which V, the so-called seed solution is the vacuum. And we found that the resulting solution U is uh, um, a one soliton solution of the sine Gordon equation, either a kink or an anti-kink. Uh, that was controlled by the sign of this free parameter A. And the magnitude of the parameter A controlled the velocity of this uh, kink or anti-kink. In addition, there was uh, an integration constant C, which I'm not indicating here in the diagram, and that controlled the position of the center of the soliton. So that's uh, all very nice, but uh, if we were to apply uh, the Otto Becklund transform again and again, the integration uh, becomes uh, harder and harder, and so uh, it's uh, not so easy to make progress. But luckily for us, we could involve uh, a theorem due to Bianchi, that's called theorem of permutability, uh, which uh, involves a double Becklund transform. So there we're starting from a seed solution U0 and we apply Becklund transform twice with parameters A1 and A2 to get to a solution U3. And we could do it in two ways. Uh, either we apply the Becklund transform with parameter A1 first uh, and uh, uh, then uh, the, um, the Becklund transform with parameter A2, uh, or we could uh, apply the Becklund transform with parameter A2 first and then uh, with parameter A1. So the theorem tells us that the integration constants uh, in the last two Becklund uh, transforms can be arranged in such a way that we end up uh, uh, with the same solution U3. And I also mentioned, but we'll see more about this today, that actually the solution U3 uh, contains uh, in a way two more solitons than the solution U0. Good, so why was this uh, theorem of permutability powerful? Well, it was powerful because uh, we now have uh, two ways to apply the Becklund transform. Either we go through the upper root here through U1 or through the lower root, which uh, passes through U2. And uh, uh, the theorem tells us that we end up uh, with the same results. And so by comparing the results uh, that we get by going through the upper root and the lower root, we found uh, an algebraic relation here in equation 5.21 uh, among the four solutions, U0, U1, U2, and U3. And uh, in particular, as we'll see later today, we can use this uh, to determine U3 uh, once we know the seed solution U0 and the solutions U1 and U2 which we obtain by applying the Becklund transform once. I also remind you that uh, to find algebraic relation 5.21, we just needed to focus uh, uh, on uh, uh, one half of the pair of relations that define the Becklund transform. In particular, we only use the first relation uh, up here, uh, which involves the x plus derivative. So now to check that everything is consistent, uh, let's see what happens. Uh, when we follow the same logic, but now uh, for the second half uh, of the uh, Becklund transform, namely the equations that involve the x minus derivative. So let's do that next. So to check uh, that the procedure is consistent, Let's see what happens. For the part of the Becklund transform, which involves uh, the x minus derivative. Again, we'll have to compare the upper root from u0 to u3 to the lower root. Let's start from the upper root. So we start from the seed solution U0, apply Becklund transform with parameter A1 to get to U1, and then Becklund transform with parameter A2 to get to 
uh, u3. And now we use uh, this relation here. So for the first speculum transform from u0 to u1, we find that uh, u1 plus u0 uh, x minus derivative is equal to minus 2 a1 sine of u1 minus u0 divided by 2. And for the second Becklin transform, we get u3 plus u1 x minus derivative is equal to minus 2 a2 sine of u3 minus u1 divided by 2. So now if we subtract the two equations, we get on the left-hand side u0 minus u3 x minus derivative, and on the right-hand side, I'll write first a positive term, 2a2 sine u3 minus u1 over 2 minus 2a1 sine of u1 minus u0 over 2. For the lower root uh, from u0 to u3, which goes through u2, uh, we obtain the result by swapping the roles of uh, a1 and a2 and u1 and u2. So we get uh, uh, u0 uh, minus u3 x minus derivative is equal to 2a1 sine of u3 minus u2 over 2 minus 2a2 sine of u2 minus u0 over 2. Here are the two equations again. So now the left-hand sides are equal, and so the right-hand sides should also be equal. And we equate in them, uh, we get uh, the following algebraic relation. I'm going to divide by 2. So I'll get a2 sine of u3 minus u1 over 2 minus a1 sine of u1 minus u0 over 2 is equal to a1 sine u3 minus u2 over 2 minus a2 sine of u2 minus u0 over 2. So we now have two algebraic relations, uh, equation 5.21 that I showed earlier and equation 5.25. And consistency requires that uh, they agree. To check that, uh, let's uh, first massage equation 5.21. Here's uh, equation 5.21 again. So I'm going to write on the left hand side terms which multiply 1 over a1, and on the right hand side terms which multiply 1 over a2. So 1 over a1 multiplies sine of uh, u1 plus u0 over 2 uh, minus sine of uh, u3 plus u2 over 2. And 1 over a2 multiplies sine of uh, u2 plus u0 over 2 minus sine of u3 plus u1 over 2. Next, I'm going to multiply by a1, a2 over 2 throughout. 
and I will also use a trigonometric identity that tells us that sine A plus or minus sine B is equal to two sine of A plus minus B over two times cosine of A minus plus B over two. So uh, on the left-hand side, now I get uh, A2 times uh, the sine of, uh, uh, I need a minus b over two. So that's uh, u1 plus u0 minus u3 minus u2 over four. That multiplies the cosine of uh, a plus b over two. So u1 plus u0 plus u3 plus u2 over four. And on the right hand side, I get A1 sine of U2 plus U0 minus U3 minus U1 over two times cosine of U2 plus U0 plus U3 plus U1 over four. I can get the right hand side by uh, taking the left hand side and swapping uh, indices one and two. So now we see that we get the same cosine factor on the left hand side and the right hand side and uh, u naught, u1, u2 and u3 are uh, uh, rather generic functions. So this will generically be non-vanishing. So we can simplify. Similarly, equation uh, 5.25, can be written as follows. And I'll leave it to you as an exercise to check the details. So now we get the A1 times the sine of U3 minus U2 plus U1 minus U0 over four times the cosine of U3 minus U2 minus u1 plus u0 over four, and that's equal to a2 sine of u3 minus u1 plus u2 minus u0 over four times the cosine of u3 minus u1 minus u2 plus u0 over four. And again, the cosine factors are common and cancel out. And so we see that equation 5.27 agrees with the 5.26 upon simplification. Now to proceed, we can uh, massage uh, equation 5.26 uh, further. So equation 5.26 is equivalent to, once we simplify the cosine factors, uh, A1 sine of uh, U0 minus U1 plus U2 minus u3 divided by four is equal to a2 sine of u0 plus u1 minus u2 minus u3 over four. To simplify uh, the next manipulations, let uh, a be u0 minus u3 over four and b be u1 minus u2 over 4. Then uh, the previous equation is uh, a1, which multiplies the sine of uh, a minus b equal to a2, which multiplies the sine of a plus b. 
and we've used uh, trigonometric identities. The left hand side is a1 times sine a cosine b minus sine b cosine a, and the right hand side is a2 sine a cosine b plus sine b cosine a. Now let's divide through by cosine a cosine b. So we get uh, a1 times tangent a minus tangent b on the left hand side and on the right hand side we get a2 times tangent of a plus tangent of b. Finally, let's bring tangent A to the left-hand side. That multiplies A1 minus A2. And let's bring tangent of B to the right-hand side. That multiplies A1 plus A2. Finally, let's divide by A1 minus A2. So we get that tangent of a, which was uh, u naught minus u3 over four is equal to a1 plus a2 over a1 minus a2 times the tangent of b, which was u1 minus u2 over four. Now, the advantage of this expression compared to the uh, algebraic relations that we uh, derived earlier is that the u3 only appears once. Equivalently, we can write this as uh, tangent of uh, u3 minus u0 over 4 by changing sign on the left hand side. And if you do the same on the right hand side, we get. Uh, a2 plus a1 over a2 minus a1 times the tangent of u1 minus u2 over 4. This is the version of the relation that uh, we're going to use uh, in the following. And the uh, good news is that this allows us to express u3 in terms of u0, u1, and u2. This takes us to section 5.6, where we construct uh, the two soliton solution of the sine Gordon equation. This will be the main application of the permutability theory. So what we're going to do is to take uh, the seed solution u0 to be the vacuum. So u0 is equal to 0 in uh, equation 5.29. Then uh, u1 and u2 are uh, one soliton solutions, so kinks or anti kinks. which I remind you are of the form tangent of ui over four equal to e to the theta i, where i runs from one to two. Where I remind you the exponents theta i were equal to epsilon i gamma i times x minus x bar i minus b i t as seen in section 5.4. P 
Here, I remind you, epsilon i was a, a sign, either plus one or minus one, that was the sign of the background parameter a. Uh, b i are the velocities, gamma i are the Lorentz factors, and x bar i are the positions of the uh, centers of the two solitons uh, at time equals zero. Then uh, in equation 5.29, u naught uh, is equal to zero. So the left-hand side that determines u3, the double background transform. So let's write that again. And I'll call the prefactor on the right-hand side mu. we get the tangent of uh, u3 over four is equal to mu times the tangent of uh, u1 minus u2 over four, uh, where mu is equal to a2 plus a1 over a2 minus a1. And we can rewrite the previous expression by using a trigonometric identity, namely tangent of uh, a minus b is equal to tan a minus tan b over one plus tan a times tan b. Then we get that the tangent of u3 over four is equal to mu times tangent of u1 over four minus tangent of u2 over four divided by one plus tangent of u1 over four times tangent of u2 over four. That's equation 5.32 and the next one is equation 5.33. But uh, I remind you that tangent of u1 over four was e to the theta one and tangent of u2 over four was uh, e to the theta two. So that was equation 5.30. So if we plug that uh, in 5.32, we get uh, that the tangent of uh, u3 over four is equal to mu times tangent of u1 over four, that was exponential of theta one minus tangent of u2 over four, that was exponential of theta two. And in the denominator, we get one plus the product of the tangent, so e to the theta one plus theta two. So this is equation 5.34. And uh, as we will see in the following, this describes a two soliton solution of the sine Gordon equation. Next, I have a remark. Note that uh, if the two solitons uh, have the same velocities, namely v1 is equal to v2. Uh, we can rewrite this in terms of the background parameters a as uh, a1 squared minus one over a1 squared plus one. That was velocity one, uh, which must be equal to velocity two. So a2 squared minus one over a2 squared plus one. And uh, uh, this is equivalent to a1 squared being equal to a2 squared or a1 equal to plus or minus a2. I'll let you check this by solving the previous equation. But then when we plug a1 equal to plus or minus a2 in the parameter mu in equation 5.33, we see that mu is equal to zero or infinity. If a1 is equal to a2, mu is equal to infinity. 
if a1 is equal to minus a2, mu is equal to zero. But uh, either way, the two soliton solution in 5.34 breaks down. either because we get tangent equal to infinity or we get tangent equal to zero. So then uh, U3 uh, becomes constant. So in particular, notice that uh, there is no static soliton, two soliton solution. As we see later, the reason will be that the two solitons uh, actually exert a force uh, on each other, and that's the reason why uh, they can't be still. But this is uh, a bit too fast. Uh, we don't even know yet that uh, the solution 5.34 that uh, we just obtained uh, does uh, indeed involve two solitons. So let's try to understand this next. That takes us to section 5.7, where we look at uh, asymptotics of multisoliton solutions. Uh, in fact, uh, we will just look at uh, two soliton solutions. Uh, but the method applies more generally. So our goal will be to study the new solution uh, 5.34 and to identify two solitons uh, hidden uh, in its asymptotics as t goes to minus or plus infinity. Namely before and after their collision. For example, we might see that uh, before the collision, we have uh, an anti-kink and a kink. Which are moving uh, uh, against one another. And after the collision, the kink will be on the left and the anti-kink uh, will be on the right. Moving uh, further away from one another. I should say that uh, it's not uh, entirely obvious uh, how to do this uh, analytically. In particular, if we just take uh, the limit in which t goes to minus or plus infinity with the position x fixed, then the two solitons will go to infinity. And we'll miss them.
instead, what we should do is uh, to follow one or the other soliton by letting uh, time go to plus or minus infinity, but keeping fixed uh, the combination capital XP equal x minus v times t. For some appropriate uh, constant velocity, capital V. Indeed, if there is a, a soliton uh, moving at velocity v in the original coordinates, velocity capital V in the original x and t coordinates, it will uh, appear stationary in the new coordinates. capital XV comma T. And for this reason, these are called co-moving uh, coordinates uh, or the reference frame is called co-moving frame. It's called co-moving because uh, it moves together with an object uh, which moves at fixed velocity V. So what we're hoping is that there will be a soliton moving at precisely the velocity v, and then it will uh, appear stationary in this uh, uh, new coordinate system. Okay, that's all for today. What we'll do next time is uh, to apply this idea to the uh, two soliton solution 5.34 that uh, we have uh, just obtained. And uh, we will see that indeed uh, it does contain uh, two solitons. Uh, and we'll do that by looking at the asymptotics uh, using the uh, limit 5.35. I remind you that we have a problems class tomorrow. So see you there. <laughs>